Yes, and we're live. Hi, welcome on this human, International Human Rights Day live from Armenia's Rotterdam. Uh, welcome to the people that are here in the room. Um, my name is Gertjan Verboom. I work at Donna Daria, the Center of Emancipation in Rotterdam. Uh, and next to me is uh, Regina Klein, coordinator of um, Shelter City. Uh, we're going to start with a short Q&A on what Shelter City is. Uh, then we will welcome the current guest of Shelter City to do a presentation on her work. Uh, and we start with the Sherry Storm. So that's like stumbling on my speech. Uh, we'll end with uh, sharing stories from human rights activists. Um, so welcome, Regina. Thank you. Thank um, you. Can you introduce Shelter City to us a little bit? How was it founded in Rotterdam? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we started two years ago uh, as a pilot because um, yeah, the, the City Council of Rotterdam um, uh, yeah, found it very important also to be a part of Shelter City. So yeah, we started from scratch. Uh, I uh, yeah, found a, a team uh, around me to to help with uh, all kinds of set up, uh, all kinds of activities, uh, to uh, to look for uh, partners who want to cooperate with us, such as the, the Erasmus University, Verhalen uit Belvedere. What else? Amnesty Rotterdam. <laughs> to set up a program, uh, yeah, to, to get as much as effort uh, out of the program uh, for the human rights defenders. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why is it so important that Rotterdam hosts these human rights defenders? Yeah, I think it's very important that uh, yeah, Rotterdam is, is such a multicultural city. Uh, I think now we have 200 uh, different nationalities. Yeah, uh, leading up to 200, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think it's very important um, that people can see, uh, yeah, how how difficult it is for human rights defenders, and uh, yeah, to see all kinds of different uh, things from all over the world, what is happening and what is important to, um, yeah, to to cooperate with each other. And so for us, it, it is an honor and a privilege to, to work with different uh, human rights defenders. Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of different topics that go under the umbrella of human rights. <coughs> um, can you share a little bit um, what previous guests were working on in their countries? Yeah. Yeah. For, uh, till now, we had five uh, guests uh, in our shelter. Um, the first guest was uh, a, a woman from India and who came up for the, the people, the untouchables, yeah, the Dalit women. So there is a big caste system, and, uh, yeah, you ha but, but they don't even fit in the caste. Yeah, they are below that. Mm -hmm. So, so horrible to hear the stories uh, from the things, yeah, they, they, they every day uh, they, they are uh, coping with in India. Uh, we had a, a couple of LABGTI uh, uh, transgenders uh, in our uh, shelter. And that, uh, I think the most important thing is that uh, human rights defenders can have some rest. Yeah. Because what I hear every time they come uh, in, in our place, is, oh no, I have... Uh, the, the safety and 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 the yeah the the possibility to to just go around for for shopping something mm. and nobody is uh, look I don't have to to watch over my shoulder every time because that's that's what they're facing uh, every day yeah yeah but they don't only rest as I know from <laughs> uh, having contact with the with the current guest yeah. Um, what, why is it also important that they are in Rotterdam and how do they reach out and learn and share expertise with our Dutch community? Uh, yeah, for example, our current uh, <laughs> Chef the City guest is learning to speak Dutch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's also uh, very important that they uh, yeah, showing around Rotterdam. Uh, we have different buddies and, and one mentor. Nikki is a mentor of the, of the project. Um, yeah, and so that they know in which country they are, uh, they are 
uh, staying. So that's very important. But it's, it's, it's constantly looking for the, the balance between working and uh, yeah, have some leisure, uh, sporting, uh, take good care of yourself, uh, for instance, to only to buy good food, you know. Yeah. Some human rights defenders, they, they, yeah, in, in, in her country, they, they, they don't uh, buy food because it's not possible to go out every time to a supermarket or something. Yeah. But the balance between work and rest is, for every human rights defender, very difficult. Because they feel, sometimes they feel guilty because yeah, they, they should have been there, eh, because there's a lot of work. But yeah, I also say, if you don't take care of yourself, eh, it's the same when you uh, get in a plane eh, and, and the, mm -hmm. uh, the purser tells you to put out the, the mask of the, the, the oxygen first to yourself instead of giving it to the child. And that's yeah, what constantly is, is, is difficult for them and looking for a balance. Yeah. Yeah. And your human rights defenders also speak at um, events like this. Um, yeah. If there are organizations watching out there that want to support Shelter City and their guests, um, what type of um, support do you need uh, and how can they get in contact with Shelter City? Um, well, they can come in contact with Shelter City. There's a Justice and Peace, is the, the, uh, the national um, um, organization, yeah? and there you find all the cities and all the contact uh, email addresses and things like that. So on the site of Justice and Peace, on the Shelter City, you can find uh, all the, co the, the contact uh, um, things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the contact details are on the, the website. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's good. And we're constantly looking for, for other people and, and, and organizations who want to work with us. Yeah. yeah. Because sometimes it's good to, yeah, to give some lectures at the Erasmus University or uh, maybe some high schools. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. also good to, to, to raise awareness, um, but also maybe some, some, some small uh, projects or things like yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're happy uh, of, uh, about our first collaboration with Shelter yeah. City. Yeah. Uh, I hope there will be many more to come. Yeah. Um, and I think we will give the floor now to the yeah. current inhabitant of Shelter City, um, human rights lawyer Sarina. Uh, if you're on the floor here, give her a round of applause. Yeah. Um, and we will join you for a Q&A later. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Donna Daria, for uh, this uh, opportunity for me to share the stories of from home and I'm grateful for Shelter City and Justice and Peace for bringing me here to the nice city of Rotterdam. So again, good afternoon. I am Zarina Goldes Musni. I am a human rights lawyer from the Philippines and this afternoon I will be celebrating with you the International Human Rights Day. So thank you very much for coming and for those who are uh, online, thank you very much for sh uh, also sharing with us your time. Uh, but before I try to share uh, what we work, uh, what we do back home, and the face and the um, uh, the risks and the nature of our work uh, in human rights lawyering in the Philippines, let me try to show you uh, the clients that we serve in the Philippines. No, by showing you this video, I hope it works. No. mga alaw na nagklase mi dito ah natinga lang mi nga kanang kusog kay nga buto kusog kay nga buto mat among subject adto ah 
grade 7 or grade 8 anak si mambing hala unsa to dali mo gawas mo kay mo hapatat didto mi samayan kay bukid man to siya sa mo ang naga ta mong classmate nga dere ra mo agi lang bala tapos dere ao nang hilak mi ana ana sila nga maghilak hilak mo ning mga anak sa NPA gipalin niya mi tagsa tagsa og gina kuha nila among pangalan og gina pitsuran mi tagsa tagsa kay basin kami daw ang mosunod nga moliho kay ana hila hila na ko nila pa ikot ikot sa sulod sa campus wala gyud mi ang nag plano nga mabakwit pero na force gi migbakwit kay gi force man gyud mi nila nga gipahawa sa school man lagi to ino ingon nila nga ispilahan daw sa NPE iligid ko mo tuuin ana nga ngano NPE man kun NPE pa lang na mga armas unta ila hangi pangdala nya kay suba papil og bulpen man ang ila integration pa kan sa nanya ni assignment hmm? Ang kensa na yung assignment. Ang kensa nga teacher. wala ang among eskwilahan. Okay naman siya kay bisag ahami mo pa mo adto sa tumoy man sa bukid, sa lansangan man sa ilam sa tulay pa dayon gihapon namo among pagtuon. Ana Yes, Bullet Lace Dreams. Thank you very much for watching the film. Uh, it talks of the uh, Manobo uh, Tiguahanon, if I'm not mistaken, tribe from the um, island of Mindanao, an indigenous people's community, uh, who were forced to evacuate from their ancestral domains in Surigao del Sur because of militarization in their community. And it is these types of uh, sectors, no, indigenous peoples, that we, in the National Union of People's Lawyers and the Union of People's Lawyers work with. So. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Am I? One to the right. I am pressing the one to the right. <laughs> I hope it works. Ah, there. All right. Thank you. So, defending the defenders, no? Uh, this is the role of uh, human rights lawyers in the Philippines. So, as, as stated, I hope you can see well. I am Zarina Goldias Musi, and I am a member of the National Union of People's Lawyers, or NUPL, and the Union of People's Lawyers in Mindanao, where I come from. Just to... Huh. 
think there's something wrong. But it worked this afternoon, no? Sorry about this. But yes, um, we are a, an organization of uh, lawyers, uh, law students, and paralegals. And we work for the promotion and defense of uh, human rights in the Philippines. And most of our, uh, the services that we provide, we provide them pro bono legal services to the marginalized and oppressed sectors of the society. And these include the indigenous peoples that you have seen, the farmers, women, the youth, and uh, political prisoners as well who are unjustly detained for uh, their political beliefs. I hope I can share with you the slide so. <laughs> yeah, I hope it works now. Thank you very much. So let's start, yeah? Okay, so uh, the Philippines, as you can see, no, we are a uh, 14-hour flight away. So we are at this part of, of the world. We are facing the Pacific Ocean. And in the Philippine map, the southernmost island is Mindanao, where I come from. And the region that I work with, it's in this northern Mindanao, Misamis Oriental province. So you can have an idea of geographical locations and all these sorts, no? So who are we, what we do, and who do we serve? As mentioned, uh, the National Union of People's Lawyers is a nationwide association of human rights lawyers as well as law students, paralegals, and legal workers in the Philippines, united by a commitment to the defense, protection, and promotion of human rights, especially of the poor and of the oppressed. And the Union of People's Lawyers in Mindanao, or UPLM, is its affiliate in the island of Mindanao, where I come from. And what do we do, as, as we said? Uh, we are oriented towards the active defense, protection, and promotion of human rights, covering the people's civil, political, social, economic, and cultural rights, including the advocacy and assertion of their inherent right to self-determination. So we provide legal assistance in court, as in uh, litigation, and because some of our members are also members in Congress or members in local councils, we also provide services in legislation. Who do we serve? We serve the marginalized and oppressed sectors of the society, of the Philippine society, as, as these are the most vulnerable sectors. No? These are the ones who, who need much legal assistance. So these are the indigenous peoples, no? the farmers, the minority groups, and human rights defenders such as ourselves. And in this line of work that we do, we are faced with this uh, new phenomenon of McCarthyism in the Philippines, no? as we say. It is this practice of red tagging. And in the American Dictionary, American Heritage Dictionary, it was defined as the political practice of publicizing accusations of disloyalty or subversion with insufficient regard to evidence and the use of methods of investigation and accusation regarded as unfair in order to suppress opposition. So essentially, it's a public vilification of organizations, of individuals, and naming them, uh, labeling them with names with unsubstantiated claims. So this is the McCarthyism, no, uh, named after Senator McCarthy in 1950s, a senator in the United States. And this phenomenon of red tagging was defined by an associate justice of the Supreme Court in the Philippines, Justice uh, Marvik Leonen, when he mentioned in a case that this phenomenon of implicating progressive civil leaders to heinous crimes is called, in fact, red baiting or red tagging. And it car this practice caricatures, no? caricatures these groups, these civil and uh, democratic groups, as communist groups, making them easy targets of government, military, or paramilitary units. So that our clients, human rights defenders, the marginalized sectors who demand, uh, who assert their rights to a dignified life, no? are being labeled or are being targeted with this red tagging. So that when the indigenous peoples, as you have seen in the video, when they assert their rights to self-determination, when the workers demand for just and humane conditions of work, when the urban poor demands for adequate and uh, free housing in the cities, when the youth demands for a higher su state subsidy for a quality and accessible uh, education, when the church, as this one, no? 
as the, as, as the Ar Armenian church, when they serve the poor to follow the word of Christ or to follow the biblical verses, they are red tagged as being members of the Communist Party of the Philippines, as members of the New People's Army, as an armed combatant. So that this red tagging in the Philippines comes in the form of flyers or tarpaulins that are hung all around the cities where we operate. These are hung in strategic locations, no? around the malls, in the markets, in terminals. Uh, vilifying groups, Bayan Muna party list, it's a, a legitimate party list in the Philippines. The Rural Missionaries of the Philippines, an organization where I worked with, it's uh, an organization of priests, nuns, and lay workers working for the rural poor. And we are, and these groups are being labeled as members of the Communist Party of the Philippines, NPAs, or worse, as terrorists. And it's not just groups that are being labeled, no, also individuals as well. As you can see in this um, photo, this leaflet, uh, this is uh, Father Rolando Abejo, a priest of the Iglesia Filipina Independiente, who is caricatured here as some kind of a demon because of his active work in promoting and defending the rights of indigenous peoples. You can see here it's um, uh, a vandalism along the highway in Bukidnon where it says like a mathematical formula adding our family name, Musni plus Zarate, the congressman from Bayan Muna, Tabakon, a public school teacher, as a uh, new people's army, meaning we are armed co combatants no? because of the work that we do. So that this red tagging is really dangerous because as observed by Mr. Philip Alson, he was the former special rapporteur on extrajudicial summary or arbitrary executions. And he, in fact, visited the Philippines sometime in 2007 or 2008, if I'm not mistaken. And he observed that the result of this red tagging is that a wide range of groups, including human rights advocates, such as ourselves, women's groups, indigenous organizations, are classified as fronts and then as enemies of the state that are accordingly considered to be legitimate targets. So then, if you are a human rights defender, you are considered as an enemy of the state. And what does that mean? You are uh, subjected to several harassments, intimidations, and threats, which may come in the form of a trumped-up charge. A trumped-up charge is a false accusation, a criminal accusation of a non-bailable offense filed in court. So that these persons, Datu Jumuring Guaynon, Teresita Naol, and Irene Odarbe, all human rights defenders in my region, northern Mindanao region, are facing non-bailable offenses of serious illegal kidnapping, destructive arson, robbery, multiple murders, because of the work that we do. Be before they were charged with these cases, they they, in their personal capacities, or the organizations that they work with, had already been red tagged. So you see that this red tagging is a prelude no, to harassments, intimidations, and threat. But it's not just trumped up charges that we are facing with. As we have seen our human rights defenders being gunned down, as what have happened to Zara Alvarez and Randy Chanis, who have been bloody uh, victims of bloody murders just this year in August. In fact, uh, um, today I hope uh, it's, it's not true that a journalist in the Philippines just this morning in the Philippines has been um, targeted to, uh, of summary killings. I, I haven't heard yet if she's alive, but I hope she is. She's a journalist no, in the Philippines. So this is what happens in the Philippines today, Human Rights Day. But this red tagging does not, is not limited to our clients alone, as it has extended to the lawyers. No? to the National Union of People's Lawyers and other human rights lawyers, such as uh, UPLM. So through this guilt by association, our organizations are also red tagged. Through flyers and posters, we are also seen as lawyers of the terrorists. So that um, uh, individuals, individual members of our organization, are also being red tagged. You can see here, uh, in the second um, uh, photo is a leaflet uh, featuring my mother. She's also a human rights lawyer as a commander of a battalion of the New People's Army. And in that uh, further uh, photo features myself as a financer no, of a New People's Army. A human rights lawyer can barely uh, support himself or himself. How much more would he or she support uh, an armed uh, revolution? No. 
So this is really uh, false and uh, baseless uh, vilifications which are made publicly against uh, the victims or targets of red, uh, red tagging. And also our clients, as well as our lawyers, are also subjected to trumped-up charges as what have happened to Attorney Jose Bihil, Attorney Catherine Panguwoban, and our chairperson, Neri Colmenares, who have been subjected also to false charges of serious illegal kidnapping. So I think one of these cases have been already dismissed, but Attorney Neri Colmenares still faces a few more cases in court. Ah, and of course, our, our members in the legal profession, we also have our fallen heroes, no? such as Attorney Benjamin Ramos and Anthony Trinidad, who, are, who were... Uh, lawyers of sugarcane farmers in the Negros Island in Visayas in the Philippines, and before they were gunned down to death, yes, they were, um, they had been uh, red-tagged uh, incessantly no, in their uh, respective cities. So that, what is the repercussion of this red-tagging? The basic thing that we've, uh, that we've observed by this red-tagging is that lawyers have been afraid to take on the prosecution of human rights violations in defense of alleged drug offenders or human rights uh, activism for fear of reprisal from state forces. In fact, a member of the UPLM has respectfully declined to take on human rights uh, violations cases because he fears of being red-tagged, he fears of being harassed, intimidated, and threatened, he fears of being gunned down, and he has a family to feed. So of course it is an, a, a natural thing to have, no? This fear of being fear of reprisal from the state. So that this red tagging is very dangerous because it it's an it's an assault to the legal profession, no? It is an assault to the legal profession because governments, under the basic principle and the role of law, role of lawyers, uh, under the. Um, uh, adopted by the 8th uh, United Nations Congress, it says that government shall ensure that lawyers are able to perform all of their professional functions without intimidation, hindrance, harassment, or improper interference, and shall not suffer or be threatened with prosecution or administrative, economic, or other sanctions for any action taken in accordance with recognized professional duties, standards, and ethics. So as lawyers in the, profession of, in the practice of our legal profession, we should not be threatened or hampered in any way. But this is not the case. And this red tagging violates the right of lawyers to take part in public discussion of matters concerning the law, the administration of justice, and the promotion and protection of human rights without suffering professional restrictions by reason of their lawful action or their membership in a lawful organization. So when we are defending the indigenous peoples, we are being red tagged. So that this red tagging violates no, the role of lawyers the oath that we have taken to promote and defend uh, these, uh, the rights of these vulnerable sectors of society. But more so, this red tagging of lawyers affects, no? it denies the people's right to legal assistance. It has been said that all persons, all persons, have effective access to legal services for the advocate protection of the human rights and fundamental freedoms to which all persons are entitled, be they economic, social, cultural, or civil and political, and that special attention should be given to assisting the poor and other disadvantaged persons because those who have less in life should have more in law. So that the role of lawyers have a very crucial, is a very crucial uh, play, uh, 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 role to play. No? The lawyers have a very crucial role to play in society in so far as the marginalized and oppressed sectors are concerned. Because uh, lawyers, a professional association, we provide legal services to all in need of them and in cooperating with governmental and other institutions in furthering the ends of justice and public interest. So that this red tagging this red baiting, this whatever phenomenon that you would call it, should stop, no? Because the net effect is to harass activists and dissenters. It stifles and punishes dissent and free speech. Uh, it confuses and creates fear, panic, and paranoia. And it prejudices the practice of our profession and prevents accountability for abuses and corruption. So this madness must stop. So, 
Now that you have known the human rights situation in the Philippines, the, the, the situation of the defenders of the Philippines, you might ask, or I hope you would ask, no, what we can do together. So, of course, you can join us in condemning the attacks against the legal profession. Maybe you have parents or aunts, uncles, or friends who are lawyers. No, Maybe you can also uh, share to them uh, that uh, the legal profession in the Philippines is being attacked. And you can condemn... Join us in condemning the attacks against the Filipino people's exercise of the basic human rights and enjoyment of fundamental freedoms. Secondly, you can help us by supporting or initiating legal actions, engaging international mechanisms. You have here the uh, ICJ and the ICC. Uh, in fact, we have lodged a complaint in the ICC against President Duterte for, war against, for his crimes against humanity. And you can help us facilitate or follow up you know, the Office of Prosecutor Bensuda on this matter. And perhaps you can contribute to raising public awareness in the human rights situation in the Philippines by sharing this information that you have uh, gained now. Or maybe you can write some articles or research or thesis papers if you are students, you know, or if uh, if uh, restrictions are already lifted, you can come and visit us in the Philippines and perhaps join a community immersion. So I'm sure there are a lot of ways where you can help and, and join in this uh, defending the defenders. So I leave you now no, with this uh, inspiring quote by our chairperson of the National Union of People's Lawyers. Because despite the threats that we face, despite the risks, uh, the harassments and the intimidations and the threats to our lives and security, we are still inspired to move on because we know that what we fight for is because we fight for what is right, because, for what, because we fight for what is just, and because we fight for and with the people. In the end, we know that we shall win. So please join us because together, let us defend the defenders. So ang tao, ang bayan, ngayon ay lumalaban. The people united will never be defeated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tsarina. I will welcome. give you my, ah. my place to sit on because you are here to rest, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we will have uh, a discussion of, well, it's not a discussion, it's more like sharing stories. Yeah. That was your idea. Um, and we have... Sama, I think, on the Zoom link. Um, also a former Shelter City guest. Ah, oh. hello. Hi, welcome online, Tama. And uh, we have GA, who is joining us as well. Um, so I can see. And, uh, and, and of course, you can see. Yeah, stay. <laughs> but I can see Tama. <laughs> okay. Um, GA, can you maybe first introduce oh, yourself? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so my name is Jie and I have two jobs. My day job is working at a human rights organization that focuses on authoritarian regimes. So countries like North Korea, like Eritrea, also the Philippines, it's uh, considered a competitive authoritarian regime. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this year during the corona pandemic, I started a second job, which is one of the co-founders of Asian Voices Europe. And it's an NGO that's in the process of registering at the Dutch Chamber of Commerce because Christmas holidays. Um, and our job is to raise awareness on racism against Asians living in Europe. So actually several of our members uh, live in Rotterdam, in The Hague, in Amsterdam, and also in other European countries. And um, yeah, today is International Human Rights Day, uh, but racism knows no holidays. Um, <laughs> And I, uh, I'm here, I think, because I'm based in the Netherlands as opposed to Shelter City guests who are temporary residents, mm -hmm. and because I can provide some insights on how human rights workers um, can choose the Netherlands as their base, um, base camp, I don't know, as their base, um, and to provide more of a Dutch perspective. Yeah, hi. And I have to turn around to Tama mm -hmm. to see the screen. Tama, can, you are also a Shelter City guest. Um, can you please introduce yourself and uh, the work and activism that you do? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, 
So my name is Tama. I'm from Indonesia. Uh, I'm a transgender person and I work uh, as an advocate for LGBTI rights here in Indonesia. And I joined Shelter City last year um, for two and a half months during uh, the winter. So October to December, just like Serena now. Uh, it was a wonderful experience and yeah. I'd love to share my experience with you. Okay. And um, in Indonesia, uh, what are the topics that you're working on? I'm working for, uh, for LGBTI issues. So uh, here in Indonesia, LGBTI people, uh, it's, we are the, it's not as oppressive as other country, but still uh, discrimination, marginalization, and exclusion, violence against LGBTI are really high, especially uh, during 2016. After 2016, uh, we experienced what we called as a crackdown. So the, the violence towards LGBTIQ are, were highly increasing. Uh, during 2016 until 17, and it affect us until now. Uh, we are now fighting uh, against uh, uh, the criminalization of LGBTIQ people because, like the right wings, the religious groups are trying to criminalize us us through uh, through uh, the the uh, proposed criminal law. So yeah, that's the situation. And I was there. Uh, in the shelter city completely to take a rest. Uh, two months full of rest, no work at all. Oh. Yeah, and when you were in Rotterdam, you didn't only take a rest, right? You met like a lot of people. Can you share something about that experience? I don't think the question came, came through. Um, when you were in the Netherlands, you didn't only take a rest, you also met like a lot of other people, right? Um, can you share something mm. about those experiences? Oh yeah, I met a lot of people, but uh, I didn't do a specific work. So mm. I, only, I only agreed to give one lecture, uh, but I, I didn't do any advocacy or networking. Uh, what I did during my stay there was like enjoying myself uh, because I really have no, uh, I don't have any uh, chance to do that mm. while working here in Indonesia. And, you know, being LGBTI activist sometimes forced me to work all the time and forget my personal need at personal needs as a person, especially as a trans person. So during my stay, I met a lot of uh, LGBTIQ friends, especially those who, uh, who are active in the fogging, um, ballroom, the communities, like the very grassroots communities. So it reminds me uh, of why I'm here, why I'm working for this issue. And uh, it reminds me that I am also uh, I need to love myself that, you know, I, I need to be, uh, I need to celebrate my identity and stuff. So, yeah, I met a lot of people, but not for working, but, you know, to, to enjoy myself more. So, and to remind me uh, about like, uh, why am I doing this work, this activism? Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. Serena, do you recognize something in that? You know, I think we are, like all four of us are into human rights. Yeah. Um, also human rights that intersect with our identities. So I also sometimes feel that when um, the personal gets political, you kind of like maybe lose yourself and everything yeah. is about that one topic. Um, how is that for you being here and like stepping away from that and finding balance? Yes. Uh, I also identify with that uh, challenge now, as Regina has mentioned earlier this afternoon. We as human rights defenders, we find that um, a challenge in our everyday lives yeah. to, to strike the balance between work and, uh, and personal self-care. No? Uh, in my case, 
I do find it very difficult because with the human rights work that we do in the Philippines, it's, it's so much stress and uh, as, as you've seen, um, uh, the harassments against uh, human rights defenders can take a toll on your personal, uh, personal health. Yeah. That is why a lot, of, a lot of human rights defenders in this period of crackdown in, in human rights situation in the Philippines, a lot would uh, take a leave, no? would lie low as, as we speak, because they could not anymore handle the threats uh, because of the work that, uh, uh, that human rights that entails. No? Um, but then, uh, while here in Shelter City, I find it some... I find some time to take a rest and take a breather and uh, enjoy um, my stay here in Rotterdam and in the Netherlands, despite the strange times that we are in now with the coronavirus pandemic. Mm -hmm. Still a lot to be grateful for. Um, but then again, uh, we all always have to, to remember that we have to take care of ourselves because if we don't take care of ourselves, then how can we take care of others? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we should not always be always just taking care of ourselves without any more taking care of others. No? Otherwise, no. we'd be too self-centered. Mm -hmm. So it's always a balance of taking care of ourselves and taking care of others as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like from the international perspective that we just heard, how can we connect that, glue that into the Dutch context from your experience? Yeah, actually, I can speak more from my human rights day job mm. experience. So every year we have a three-day human rights conference in Oslo, mm -hmm. which is funded by the Norwegian government and many other foundations run by mostly white European or Western countries that have a lot of money. And we've gotten complaints that, well, for three days, you put on this extravagant like catering conference and all your human rights Defenders who come there, they eat this like expensive Norwegian salmon, they sleep in the most expensive hotel in Oslo, so you're wasting money. And we mm -hmm. tell them, yeah, they get three days in a year to do this, and you're complaining. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a duty for human rights defenders to take care of themselves, like you have mentioned, and like Tama has mentioned, because you cannot help other people if you're having a burnout. Mm -hmm. And for example, with human rights activists, many of them who come from authoritarian regimes are diasporas. They have left their countries and settled in countries like the Netherlands or in other European nations where they are in a democratic nation. And deep down, they always feel a guilt for the people that they have left behind, their friends, their family. Just um, last month, I was with uh, the Uyghur Ensemble, which is a group of Uyghur musicians in exile in Europe. And we're sitting around the table in actually a restaurant in Rotterdam, and they're all laughing and playing music. And at some point they said, Gia, you know, we have to do this because we get to do this maybe once a year with all of us. Mm -hmm. And all the other time of the year, we have to think about our family and friends mm -hmm. who are in concentration camps in Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. So they need that. And I think it is a right and the duty of us as democratic citizens to help in whatever we can, because mm -hmm. that is a privilege and a duty that we have. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned before, racism, but also like racism against um, black people, uh, people of Asian descent, but also homophobia, Islamophobia. We're not done here, right, in the Netherlands, because we're looking at the screen now and thinking, oh, that's so bad, red tagging in, uh, in the Philippines and like um, LGBT rights in Indonesia, but we're not done here, right? No, we're not done. Um, I think we've seen that clearly this year with the protest starting in March for Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. which is still ongoing because Santa Claus just came by and we know that there's a lot of places in the Netherlands where you can still see Sparta Piet. Um, but what we need to remember is that in a democratic nation like the Netherlands, we can take advantage of the rule of law and of democratic institutions that are usually being guarded and to take advantage of those systems. For example, at Asian Voices Europe, we are offered free um, lawyers um, consulting services to figure out what is the best legal way to deal against racism at work or in the street or with your colleagues. How do you talk about those things? And those things are not easily accessible in a place like the Philippines because you have to undertake personal risks to be able yeah. to do that. And you mentioned several of your colleagues don't want to be associated formally because yeah. of the danger it might pose. Correct. Yeah. We have like 
10 to 12 minutes, uh, and I want to open the floor to questions to our panel members. Um, of course, as you already yeah. said, it's like a weird corona time, so <laughs> I have a microphone on a stick. <laughs> prepared. So, so I won't be in your personal space too much. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yes. I have a question for Tama, because a while ago, I think at the start of the coronavirus epidemic, you told me about um, a project you did for trans women, uh, that you distributed food to trans women. And I was wondering how this was evolving now. Is it still going on and how did it end? Hi, Nikki. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's still going on. Uh, yeah, basically, like uh, I'm, I'm only like uh, helping my friends, my trans women friends, to or, uh, to to uh, to cater the support, uh, and they are still doing that. Uh, and the great news is they are not doing that only for the trans women, but they 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 create the the uh, what do you call it like the common kitchen for other people as well. So uh, uh, they are working in solidarity with the uh, uh, urban urban poor community, with the uh, street living, uh, children living on the street, with the sex workers. So it's a it's a it's a growing to uh, from sex from trans women, uh, it's growing bigger and bigger uh, in solidarity with uh, the other uh, groups. So it's still it's still going on. It's great. Thank you. Are there any other questions for our panel members? Oh, oh go ahead. I was wondering what's on Xarina's t-shirt. Ah. It must be uh, a phrase. Yes, I'm glad that you noticed. <laughs> Thank you. So yes, this is um, a slogan shirt. Uh, it is in our Filipino language. Uh, as you can see, it's just uh, consonants, no? But if you read it, it would say, it would produce the sound, Maki Baka Wag Ma Takot. And it would say, resist, do not fear. Maki baka is resist. Wag matakot, do not fear. So again, maki baka, wag matakot. <laughs> Thank you for noticing, Nikki. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So if there's, you kind of like live what is on your t-shirt right yes. now, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I reserve this one, this shirt for this sp specific event. <laughs> Um, GA. Oh, I'm curious because you are both Asian. Have mm. you experienced racism during your stay in the Netherlands? Ah. Ooh. Maybe Tama first, yeah? I uh, actually, I felt invisible there in Rotterdam. So I'm not sure if that's part of racism, but uh -huh. uh, <laughs> yeah, I I felt kind of invisible among the because I hang out around uh, I hang out with like uh, queer communities, so I felt pretty much invisible, and I didn't see a lot of Asian queer uh, persons around during my mm -hmm. stay there. So yeah, uh, yeah, just that mm, I don't I didn't feel like direct racism, just feeling invisible. People didn't see me. Yeah, because Mario was here. Um, Sama was here before the pandemic. You are here in the center of the <laughs> pandemic. Maybe that is kind of like a difference as well. Yes. Uh, Serena, did you experience like racism? No, not at all. No, no discrimination uh, for me that uh, when I was here as uh, either as an Asian or as a human rights defender, and so I'm very grateful for that. And maybe it's also because of the pandemic that nobody, uh, we're, we're very restricted with mm. social interactions. That is why I haven't really uh, experienced such uh, racism. And I do hope that it's, it's not just in the pandemic that I, I don't um, uh, experience this, but I hope that this racism against Asians in the Netherlands, not just in Rotterdam, would eventually end in due time. 
Yeah. So we yeah. are with you, Gia, yeah. in fighting against I'm glad racism. you haven't experienced <laughs> this during your relaxing yeah. time here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the social restrictions part is also like really weird because usually like Gia knows that after events, uh, we say, hey, let's go out and grab something to eat. But yeah, that's obviously not possible at the yeah. moment. Yes. Um, Gia, um, you didn't ask that question just for asking the question. Asian Voices Europe did a research, a survey, um, among people living in the Netherlands of Asian descent. Um, can you share a little bit more about the outcome? Yeah, so actually it's um, good that you mentioned that it's because of the pandemic, experiences can vary. I started this survey on the experience of Asians, of racism in the Netherlands and other European countries in March. And between January and March is when we saw the most severe cases of racism because it was just starting and people mm -hmm. were calling it Chinese virus, mm -hmm. um, like somebody in the US who's no longer president soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we saw that it was really fluctuating because we had the first uh, lockdown and the second lockdown. And during those times, people go out less, so there's less data. It's kind of coming back <laughs> a little bit. Um, and that's how we got started with the survey, because for a lot of human rights defenders, it starts with something personal, like you are from Mindanao, so that's also how you got started working with indigenous communities, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. Tama, you are a trans person, so you also got involved in the queer community. And for me, that also started because I'm Asian. I didn't choose to be Asian, but that's how I'm perceived here. And I had one experience, and that morning when I experienced this racist incident, I had read about another Chinese-Dutch citizen who had been assaulted in an elevator because she was Asian. So then I thought, okay, one and two cases, and then let's see how it goes. And then we got this survey. And often you need quantifiable data to make it relatable to a lot of people who do not have the same life experience as you do. Because mm -hmm. I can say, hey, I felt this, I felt that. But if you have never felt it, it's difficult to empathize. So yeah. that's how we got started with data. But yeah. we're a very small, like young organization. So. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you agree that, um, for me, maybe they were not visible before, but it seems like the last year um, a lot more like Asian groups started or were visible. Um, uh, you, your organization is one of them. Um, do you think that it's um, because of the pandemic and the like magnifying glass they put on racism in the Netherlands that they started or was there a movement before in the community? Yeah, so I thought about this on a personal level, and I started a Twitter account in 2017 when I was a student in Maastricht called Racism in Maastricht. So it didn't start just now during the pandemic. Um, but I think Asian communities have started speaking out quite recently because for a long time, there were economic migrants who came to the Netherlands and other European countries later and um, so like in the 19th century, 20th century. So the goal was, we're gonna make money, and then until we make money, we're gonna shut up and not complain because we're grateful we don't live in a dictatorship. We're grateful we're not being assaulted every day. But that is not the case of younger generations. So that, there's that difference as well. Mm -hmm. um, and if I might add, what I got asked a lot is, why aren't Asians getting as much voice as black communities? Mm -hmm. And that is because we have not been speaking up until recently. Mm -hmm. We cannot just expect people to listen to us because we start something. We have to also work at it because there are a lot of issues we need to work on in the world. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of effort and time. Yeah. So the younger generation being more vocal, Tama, I don't know how old you are, but I guess you're part of the younger, ge younger generation as well. Um, do you also see that um, in um, Indonesia, that the younger generation is more vocal? Uh, yeah, especially because of the social media and internet and stuff. Uh, I'm 30, not that young, but yeah, still young. <laughs> so yeah, my younger friends uh, for now, like for example, LGBTIQ activists, uh, there are a lot of young people, young queer uh, activists that are now, you know, everywhere, especially mm -hmm. online. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it uh, it's it's really challenging to uh, involve in like offline 
in the in the movement but online they are actually everywhere and it it have it helps a lot uh, in terms of human rights work not only the queer but in general in indonesia that's what i see like people young people really use twitter especially and instagram to speak up about human rights and you know it it's really helpful so that's cool yeah and Serena already mentioned um, how we can support uh, her cause. Uh, Tama, what can we do from the Netherlands to support you guys over there? Like, how can we help you, support you in any way? Uh, yeah, basically, uh, uh, I need to be honest that uh, Netherlands government with uh, the uh, your government, the, the Netherlands government, uh, you have this policy of, you know, uh, uh, putting LGBTIQ issues as uh, the main uh, uh, international uh, issue. So we got a lot of support from the from Netherlands uh, Dutch organizations like HIFOS, uh, COC Netherlands, uh, and uh, etc. Well, I think uh, what you can do for us, also for LGBTIQ community in general, is uh, I always say this by by also supporting LGBTIQ people there in the Netherlands, especially uh, those who are the most marginalized, like the black queer uh, mm. uh, people because like you know by supporting them you are you also supporting us you know it's uh that's the 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 value of solidarity everywhere yeah yeah i mean like uh, i do appreciate that uh, uh, dutch people want to help us here but i mean like in the meantime while you are helping our brothers sisters and family there, you are also helping us here. Yeah, thank you for that answer. Um, yeah. <laughs> I will. Hi, Tama. Regina here. <laughs> Hello, Regina. Hi. <laughs> so good to see you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was I was wondering, uh, do you experience um, still some effort from from your stay here? Ooh. Um what? Um, how did like uh, yeah. your stay here? Do you still benefit from yeah, that okay. time out? Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, like uh, you know, <laughs> uh. uh in the during my stay in the Rotterdam, I trained myself to to uh, to set my limits and boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, so, by you know you know that uh, you offer me to, for example, to see uh, see OC Netherlands or to mm -hmm. to do lecture here and there, and uh, I I actually train myself to say no there, and that's mm -hmm. the new habit that I bring here. I know for now, I know when to say yes, when to say no, to understand like, uh, it's, do I feel okay to do this work or not now? So it's it's really helpful, you know, uh, uh, helping me in a building a, a new and healthy habit in working. Wow, great. So that's really cool. And the second one, also the most, the other important thing is, uh, I had my therapist there. Yeah. Um, yeah my psychologist and then i found it very helpful so that uh now i continue to go to the to therapy here in oh, indonesia mm -hmm. uh, i re i refused to go to therapy before before my stay in shelter city and then because i found that therapy was very helpful now i'm doing it by myself you know going to therapy and it's oh it's really helpful oh. <laughs> so i get new yeah, two two great uh, habits that I get from my stay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's so wonderful. Great. To hear. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what to hear? <laughs> I think it's also important um, to um, express that the stay at Shelter City is a no strings attached stay. Right? They come here for themselves and whatever they like to contribute, like setting I here is a personal choice, but not a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy that Shelter City is in Rotterdam. Uh, I'm happy that uh, the city of Rotterdam supports it. I hope they will support it for many years to come. Um, expanded. 
expand the program. <laughs> um, so, GA, to round up this session, um, what can people in the Netherlands do to support human rights? Like, it, it, yeah, I know, you're looking at me like open door, <laughs> like, but, you know, for the people out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Normally, it's easiest to ask people to help in a very concrete but a manageable way. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Um, actually, I know that most human rights defenders, what they need most besides rest is money. So, donate some money. Mm -hmm. Because if you keep asking them, what can I do, what can I do, that's also very emotionally exhausting for them. And usually, if you go to their website, it's very clearly indicated what they need help with. Mm. And usually it is money. Mm. Well, is that too honest? Um, <laughs> no, I think that, you know, you can't do, expect people uh, to work for free all the time. Um, mm. And I think that a lot of time for activists and human rights um, activists who started, like, I think all of us, because some part of our identity needed us to you know, go out there and do something. Mm -hmm. We all start out as volunteers, but that can be super exhausting next to your work and the things you do, you know, besides that. So I don't think money is on too honest. I think money is a requirement to keep on doing what we're doing. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone at home for watching. I feel like a TV show presenter now. <laughs> thank you at home for watching. Uh, thanks everyone that came out. Uh, physically to be here. Um, you, we can like watch it later, um, so please, when it, this um, session comes online, yeah. share the stories that were shared here, uh, and I hope to see you at another event. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, real, yeah. Happy Human Rights Day, everyone. Thank you so much. Happy Human Rights Day. Thank you, Tama. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, bye bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> I think Tama's going to sleep now. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good to meet you all. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. bye. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Serena. <laughs>